In this video, I'm going to talk about the three crayon technique, which is a drawing method that utilizes red, white, and black pencils on toned paper. I'm going to give you a brief history of this technique, give some material recommendations, and then show you three different approaches to using this medium. While today, in most cases, red, black, and white chalks are synthetically produced, they're originally naturally occurring materials. Red chalk, also called sanguine, is a form of hematite, a mineral composed of iron oxide. Black chalk is a type of schist, a soft stone composed of carbon and clay, and white chalk is a form of limestone, oddly enough made up of the remains of ancient submicroscopic plankton. All three materials were commonly found in artist studios long before they were used for drawing on paper. Black and red chalk was used for doing preparatory drawings for frescoes, while white chalk was used for preparing wood panels for painting. Their potential as drawing mediums was only exploited after the proliferation of paper making in Europe. Paper, besides being far less expensive than parchment, also has the advantage of having a rougher, grippier surface that just worked better for dry media. Some of the earliest examples we have of the three crayon technique were done by Leonardo da Vinci. We also have a few drawings by Michelangelo, such as this stunning drawing. I think, though, the first artist to fully exploit the potential of the three crayon technique is the French painter Jean Clouet. In these wonderful portraits, you can see exactly what made the three crayon technique so popular. The mix of black, white, and red, combining with the underlying color of the paper, creates skin tones with subtle color nuances, such as warm reflected lights and delicate gray halftones. This technique, employing minimal means to maximum effect, tricks the eye into thinking it's seeing a full range of color, creating the illusion of living, breathing flesh. While the use of the three crayon technique in the 16th century seems to have been limited, by the 17th century, its use was quite widespread, popularized by the artist Peter Paul Rubens. To my mind, it is with Rubens that this technique reaches its apotheosis. His ability to record the most delicate movements of color and value with an effortless lightness of touch is unparalleled. The illusion of having a full range of color is complete here, as is the incredibly sensitive shifts in texture, as subtle as anything he achieved in his paintings. The mastery of this medium is complete and unrivaled. While its use in other parts of Europe waned in the 18th century, the three crayon technique continued to be widely used in France. The painter, Jean-Antoine Watteau, inspired by the drawings of Rubens, employed it with great delicacy, though in ways better suited to his more fragile sensibility. Where Rubens uses it to depict vivacity and strength, in Watteau's hands, this sensitive, versatile medium is employed in the depiction of the fleeting and the poetic. There's something in Watteau's drawings that share a closer affinity to the atmospheric effects of oil painting than drawing. His superhuman ability to suggest details through the complex counterpoint of sharp flickering strokes and soft blended passages in many ways anticipates the Impressionist movement. By the beginning of the 19th century, the three crayon technique began to wane as artists switched over to graphite and charcoal. This probably has to do with the influence of neoclassicism, an artistic movement that rejected the decorative frivolities of the Rococo period in favor of an austere style that prioritized form over color. Now that we know a little bit of history, let's talk materials. Instead of the natural red and black chalks used by the masters, we're going to use their much more widely available modern equivalents. The tragic fact is, artists began complaining about the scarcity of high quality red and black chalks at the beginning of the 1800s, and by the middle of the 19th century, these materials all but disappeared from the market, being replaced with the synthetic crayons that we all know today. And while you can still buy naturally occurring red and black chalk, in most cases it'll be of inconsistent quality. There are a number of things to consider when doing the three color technique. First, let's talk about pencils. Most pencils, besides coming in a range of hardnesses, also fall somewhere on the continuum between oiliness and chalkiness, depending on the type of binding material. For example, this Prismacolor pencil is considered very oily, whereas a pastel pencil made by Stabilo, such as this one, is on the chalkier side. This is a very important consideration because your choice of red, black, and white pencils should all have a similar consistency in terms of not only hardness, but oiliness. This is a red chalk pencil made by Conte, and it's quite chalky, but not quite as chalky as the pastel pencil. And it works quite well with the other Conte products, such as this white chalk pencil made by Conte and the Conte Pierre Noir. So you can see that they actually blend together quite effectively. However, if you try using an oily white pencil, such as this Prismacolor, with a chalky red pencil, such as this Conto, you'll find that the oilier white will actually resist the red, not allowing it to stick to the paper. So if I put down a little bit of white first, and then try putting down the red chalk on top, you'll see that the white chalk resists the red. Now, you could always start with the chalky materials first and then put the oilier ones on top, like this.
but I think it's to your advantage to choose materials that you can alternate at will without such technical limitations. Now let's talk about paper. First, paper texture is important. If you're using a chalkier material, such as Conte, I recommend paper with a bit of tooth to it, since chalky materials have difficulty sticking well to papers that are very smooth. I recommend this Canson Mi Tiense tone paper for chalk-based pencils. You can find it in any art supply store in the United States, and I find it just rough enough for the marks to stick to it, but not so rough that the texture gets distracting. Waxier pencils can be used either over smooth or rough paper. For those that like their paper very smooth, I recommend this one made by Strathmore. You can buy it in individual sheets or in sketchbooks. You can do the three color technique on papers of any color, but as you saw in the examples I showed you, it's most often done on beige or light gray paper. This is because the paper tone serves as the value of the skin, allowing you to complete the drawing much faster. I will also demonstrate a technique where I use a paper color other than beige or light gray, but it takes considerably more time to complete and is better suited for longer, more finished drawings. While you can simply buy tone paper that is either beige or light gray, you can also tone a white piece of paper such as a sheet in a sketchbook. I simply take a few inexpensive pastel sticks, such as these made by Faber-Castell, and rub them in with a paper towel. This method is great because it allows you to precisely control the color and value. You can also play with a combination of pastel colors to give the color more complexity and depth. Generally, you want something that is light brown or gray, dark enough so that the white chalk stands out against it, but not so dark that the red chalk loses contrast. One of the advantages of using a warm paper is that the color contrast of it actually makes black look a little bit cooler, a little bit more blue. And this effect can be increased by adding white to the color. So you can see how the color is a little bit bluish, but now if I add white, the effect of adding white pigment cools off the color and creates something that's even bluer. So by playing with the transparency of the color and the opacity of the color, we can go from a black that's a little bit on the cooler side to something that looks almost blue, which in effect creates an additional color that we can play with. The same thing can be done with your red color. If I use it straight, transparently, let me use a different stump here, The warm paper tone shining through the red pigment creates a very warm orangey effect. However, if I add white to my red chalk, it's gonna cool off the color and make the color go from orange to more pink. So you can see by playing with the transparency, the opacity, by mixing white into the color, we actually go from a palette of three to a palette of one, two, three, four, the paper color, five, and white, six. So this can actually be called the six crayon or the six color technique as opposed to the three color technique. Okay, now I'm gonna show you three distinct ways to use the three crayon technique. And here's the first, loosely inspired by the drawings of Watteau. By the way, I'm not going to discuss my process for constructing the head here because that's not really the point of the video. But if you wanna learn more about my methods for drawing the head, I have a large number of tutorials on my channel. For this drawing, I'm going to use white paper that I toned with pastels. Just to review, I used an inexpensive box of pastels made by Faber-Castell for this purpose, but you can also use new pastels, NU pastels, made by Creticolor, or any other brand of pastels. Just don't use anything expensive, however, since the quality of the pastels isn't important. You can also, of course, use warm brown toned paper. The color and value of the paper is important for this method. You want a paper color that represents the general color of the skin tone so that the white chalk stands out as a highlight and that the red chalk looks dark enough to represent the darkest shadows of the skin. Keep in mind that with this technique, you cannot use an eraser to make corrections, since that will also lift off the paper color. Fortunately, corrections are easily made with the same paper towel used for toning the paper. Just rub the paper towel over your lines and they'll fade right out. As for the pencils, I'm using Conte Sanguine, Conte Pierre Noir, and Conte White Chalk to do this drawing. These pencils are more on the chalkier side, but contain a small amount of waxy binder that makes them stickier and less prone to smudging than pastel pencils. Once I've sketched in the head, I'm going to go into my shading, also with red chalk, and I'm going to smooth out the first layer of shading with a blending stump. I'm working very lightly with a blending stump, which is important when using inexpensive sketchbook paper. You don't want to press too hard with a stump because it'll have a tendency to flatten the paper fibers, preventing subsequent layers of drawing material to stick to it. 
Okay, I've smoothed out my initial layer of shading. Now I'm going to go into the shadows with more red chalk to make them darker. I'm not going to blend this layer, however. I think too much use of the stump is actually bad for a drawing, because it creates an effect that is overly smooth and lacking the energy that comes from the contrast of sharp strokes and textures. I recommend using the blending stuff judiciously, and leaving the darker shadows, such as in the areas of coarse shadow and the darker cast shadows, unblended. Here's a trick that was often used by the old masters to get a touch more contrast out of their red chalk. If you wet the tip of your pencil a little, it'll go darker. The line will lighten up a little once it dries, but will still be darker than the lines put in when the pencil was dry. Okay, finished with the red, and now it's time to add black. In this approach, I'm only going to add black to areas that are physically darker, such as the details of the eyes, the hair, the eyebrows, and the shirt. Notice that I'm not blending my materials together, and though you could, keeping them separate gives the drawing a cleaner look. By the way, the order in which you do things is not particularly important, so I could have put in my white after completing the drawing with red. You'll find, however, that the order in which you apply your materials has a subtle effect on the look of the drawing. I recommend trying a, a number of variations on a technique, playing with different combinations of pencils, using different papers, until you work out what approach and materials work best for you. Now that I'm done with the black, I'm going to start laying in the white chalk. In this case, I've decided not to blend the white with a stump because I like the way unblended white chalk sits on the surface of the paper, giving the drawing a little bit more texture. One thing you'll find that even the best white chalk pencils are slightly transparent and might not give you the strong whites that you want. In this case, feel free to cheat a little by adding touches of white pastel to your drawing. Here I'm using a very dense white pastel made by Rembrandt. Here is the finished drawing. This approach to the three color technique is excellent for quick sketches, allowing you to introduce a little color and life into your drawings. It's best when done with a light touch and not overworked. This next approach is inspired by some of the drawings of Rubens. This one is a little slower and perhaps better suited for more detailed work. In this case, I'm using a very smooth light gray paper made by Strathmore. With this method, it's better to use a gray paper rather than one that's warmer, since the color contrast will make the red chalk, which is a relatively dull color, appear much more saturated. By the way, such smooth paper was not available in Rubens' time, but I'm not someone who is obsessed with historical authenticity. In this case, I'll be using pencils that are more on the oilier side. Oil-based red sanguine made by Kokinor combined with a oil-based black pencil made by Faber-Castell. As for my white pencil, I'm going to be using Prismacolor. Oil-based pencils have a number of advantages over their chalky counterparts. They stick better to a larger variety of papers, even papers that are very smooth and slick. They're also more smudge-proof and harder, and therefore better for retaining hatching and sharp textures. On the downside, they don't erase particularly well, so you'll have to work carefully at the beginning and make sure everything is correct before committing. I'm starting this drawing with black, and once the head is sketched in, I'm going to shade the drawing with my black pencil. I should note that wax-based pencils are usually a little lighter than their chalky equivalents, so the drawing will end up having a little bit less contrast. To my mind, this is fine. Not every technique needs to have a full range of contrast, and I think the three-crayon technique is better suited to a more delicate subject matter anyway, one that doesn't require super dramatic lights and darks. As you can see, I'm building up the values with layers of mostly single directional hatching, occasionally shifting the angle slightly to reinforce curves in the form. Before I complete the darkest values in the shadows, I'm going to switch over to my white pencil and add some lighter values. This is an important step. When working on tone paper, you should always work from the midtones out in both directions. This is because our eyes perceive value relative to other values. In other words, it's hard for me to judge how dark the shadows need to go until I have some idea of the values in the lighter parts. This is why I always work back and forth, shading a little bit, then adding a little bit of white, then shading a little bit more, then adding a little bit more white, etc. By the way, make sure to erase any black marks in any areas where you plan to add white. Prismacolor white is quite transparent and will not cover any black strokes, and those black strokes will be harder to erase once you put white over them. Once the drawing is close to complete in black and white, I start introducing my red chalk. The red in this case is used only where the skin is more reddish, such as the nose, the cheeks, the lips, and the inside of the eye. I also use touches of red in the reflected lights. As you can see, this in many ways is a reverse of the first technique, where I begin with red and use black in a very limited way. 
Here I'm relying on black for most of my drawing, using red quite sparingly. The other difference is that I'm doing more mixing of color here, with the three pencils overlapping and blending together to get a variety of colors. Soft gray browns for the shadows, warm and cool reflected lights, as well as a range of skin tones in the lights. While the first technique was essentially a sketching technique that could give the drawing a touch of color variety, this technique lends itself better for longer drawings that achieve the impression of being in full color. Here is the finished drawing. Now on to the last technique. For this drawing, I'm using a very nice handmade blue paper from Saint Armand, a Canadian paper mill that makes drawing, printmaking, and watercolor paper. As for the pencils, I'm using Carbothello pastel pencils, which are very chalky. With this technique, I'm starting with my black pencils, as I did with the second technique. These pencils, unlike the oil-based pencils, are very soft and dark, so I'm working very lightly as to not, put, not to put down too much drawing material too quickly. These pencils erase fairly well, so I can easily make corrections at this point, but keep in mind that fixing things will be difficult once the drawing media is built up, so make sure to eliminate problems early. Once I have the head sketched in, I begin shading. The paper is already quite dark, however, so I don't need to make the shading that much darker. By the way, for this technique, the paper can be of any color, but I think having a paper that is on the cooler side, such as a blue, complements the red chalk very well and gives the drawing more vibrancy. The most important thing here is the paper texture. Since Carbothello pencils are a very chalky material, you want to use a paper that has more tooth to it so that it grabs the pigment particles more effectively. Now that I've shaded a little bit, the next step may seem counterintuitive. I'm going to go over the entire drawing with a layer of white. Unlike the first two techniques that employed the paper as one of the colors of the skin tone, this method is opaque. So I'm doing two things here, eliminating the paper color underneath so that it doesn't distract me, and building up the layers of drawing material so that they start to blend together. Once I've gone over everything with white, I'm going to go in and darken the shadows a little, and then strengthen the white, following the principle of working back and forth between my shadows and lights. I will do this several times, and then go on to the next stage. Now that I have the drawing more or less modeled in black and white, I will do something that is, again, counterintuitive. I will go over the entire drawing with red chalk. This will warm up my shadows and give my lighter areas a pink skin tone. The next step is to go back into the shadows and strengthen them, and to get a little bit more specific with the variety of reflected lights that I'm seeing. Then I'm going to go back into the lights with touches of red in areas that need them and add highlights to add the necessary contrast. At this point, my drawing can be considered complete, a relatively rough sketch with a variety of color created by the complete intermixing of my three colors. The drawing is made more lively by the fact that I didn't use a blending stump, instead creating my mixtures of color by layering my colors one on top of the other. The blue of the paper striking through the drawing also gives the drawing an additional energy. If I want to continue working on this drawing and create a more finished and smoother effect, I can go back in with a blending stump. Just be careful not to press down too hard with a stump, especially with a soft handmade paper such as this one, lest you flatten out the tooth, preventing additional layers of drawing material from adhering to the surface. As with the first technique, after stumping, you should go back in with your pencils and reinforce the contrast and brighten up your colors. My advice is not to stump at all as you finish up the drawing. By leaving the highlights and the darkest darks unblended, you'll give the drawing more energy and impact. With this technique, I'm able to work and rework the drawing for much longer periods of time, creating all kinds of color nuances that start approaching some of the effects you can get in full color pastel or even in wet media like oil or acrylics. This is a fantastic approach for long finished drawings or for studies for full color paintings where you want to record color information without resorting to doing a full color sketch. Here is the finished drawing. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to the three color technique. This long overlooked and forgotten medium, which until recently was considered antiquated, is making a comeback with a resurgence of interest in historical art making practices. To my mind, it's a great gateway to working in full color, allowing you to develop a sensitivity to color temperature and the many ways skin color can shift from warm to cool. Most importantly, it's a fun and pretty way to draw, making for very lively and vivid drawings. Thanks for watching this video, and as always, if you have any questions or comments, leave them below and I'll be happy to respond. Respond.